Yeah. Hello. Oh. Ah. Okay. It's on. Thank you, Colin. What a guy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see everyone today. We have some visitors today. Right there and right back there. And I won't point you out or anything to embarrass you. So it's nice to have you today. It's nice to see your smiling faces. Okay. You introduce, yes. Yeah, these are my friends, Jim and Dee. They've been my friends for years and years. So. Well, it's nice I'm to have you. from Redding, California. Oh. Oh, okay. glad they're glad You came up for cooler weather? <laughs> yeah. Not the smoke. Oh, kind of. Yeah. So you have fire there, too. So, yeah. Oregon is on fire. I don't know if California is, but Oregon is on fire. Well, it was nice to have you. Mallory, it's nice to have you today. It was great to have you in Sunday school, too. I hope you come back. Thank you. So, I just have a little ditty here. I shared it in Sunday school, but it made me think, <clears throat> because I was sitting on the pity pot last week. Have you ever sat on the pity pot? You know, oh, poor me. But anyway, so my devotion the next day was this. I used to ask God to help me, and then I asked if I might help him. I ended up by asking God to do his work through me. So if you ever are sitting on the pity pot and asking, oh God, please help me, uh, change your attitude and ask how you can help him, and your attitude will change. Definitely. So it's nice to be here today with everybody and uh, have a great Sunday. Hey, we have uh, my brother Mark's in town. You haven't seen him already. Uh, so he, he was here for about four years before he went to, or a couple of years. Where he went to be a pastor at Brownsville. Now he's pastor in Nebraska. So he, he's down here for the week. Uh, okay, we got what we got coming up is we do have a um, prayer meeting and Bible study Wednesday at 2 o'clock. We have men's breakfast Wednesday at 8 a.m. at Waffle Hut. We're going to have family night Friday at 7 p.m. here. We're going to be showing the movie Prince of Egypt, and Saturday is game day at 2 o'clock here. So we got a full week, a lot of stuff to do. Uh, I think that's about all I have. Can we please lead us in prayer? Good to see all your smiling faces. If they're not smiling, come on. And then we have those smiling faces. You know, I started jogging today. I didn't really want to, but uh, I couldn't keep up with the ice cream truck. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to be reading out of uh, Revelations and uh, chapter 21. And we we'll go back to verse 5 through 8. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down. <clears throat> Excuse me. For these are words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of water of life. He who overcomes will inherit, inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual immorality, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and the liars, they'll take their place in the fiery, fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And uh, in my prayers uh, today, I'd just like to pray for all the firefighters. Uh, I probably have told anybody, but we, we do have some relatives that was evacuated down in the uh, Shingletown area. And so they don't know if they're going to have a home to go to. 
they've been out for a couple of days now and they, they just don't know. And so I would just like to keep them in prayer, Betty and Charlie. Heavenly Father, come before you today, Lord. Lord, I want to uphold all these firefighters that are out attending these massive fires in California and Oregon and in the West, Lord. We just ask that you put a hedge of protection around them, keep them safe, Lord. They're doing this for your glory. And Lord, be with Pastor Matt as he brings a message today. Lord, we just ask that you open our eyes, our ears, our heart to your word, Lord. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning. good morning. It's good to see every one of you. And I'm so glad to see Evelyn. It's been such a long time since she's been, been here. Anyway, we've been praying for her and we're really glad to see her. Anyway, if you would please stand, and that is if you feel led to stand. If you don't want to stand, you just sit right where you are. <clears throat> Turn to page 434 and we'll do verses 1, 2, and 4.
Thank you. missionaries today, or we, uh, would you bow your heads, please? We lift up Faith and Michael Turner and PNG, Lord. We just ask that you continue to be with them uh, as they reach out and with their workshops all over the islands and, and the different islands that they travel back and forth to. Lord, we lift up all of our missionaries all over the world that are in dangerous places. Lord, we ask for protection for them, that you would be with them and their families and watch over them, and that your word would get spread, and Lord, that it would just grow and grow. And we pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Ken, Jax, uh, can we please come forward for our tithes and offering? And Noah and Rachel are going to stay over for a membership class. So anybody in uh, membership members can join in if you'd like to sit in on it. Okay, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with salvation lord we bless we thank you lord that you bless us with this building evergreen baptist fellowship we thank you that you bless us with members lord with people coming to worship you but now holy one we ask father god that you might examine each one of our hearts our motives lord that we might give back to you what you have blessed us with, both spiritually and materially, Lord, and give us wisdom of what to do with your money, that you might use us, Lord, as your instruments to extend your kingdom, not only throughout the world, but right here in Klamath Falls. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please turn to page 176, and I would like to do all four of the verses.
That was very good, Tex. Okay, we're going to be in Judges, chapter 20. And we're actually going to finish the chapter, chapter 20, starting at verse 26 through 48. Um, but I'd like to open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you give us this divine opportunity every week to come in and not only have experienced corporate worship with you, Lord, but to hear your word. And now we pray, Lord God, it will mean nothing unless you, Holy Spirit, open our hearts, open our understanding, speak to us. You alone know what each one of us needs to hear. We love you, Holy One. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. It usually, as you know, when we go through, oh, by the way, we only have three more messages. We'll finish up chapter 20 today in Judges, then two more to finish up chapter 21. Then we'll go into 1 John. But you know, I usually will start out by reading all the verses, then go back and exegete each verse. But because there's 22 verses, I'm just going to go ahead and read them as we go along. So, for instance, right now I'm just going to read verse 26. Please listen carefully, because this is God's Word. Judges 20, starting at verse 26. Then all the children of Israel, that is, all the people, went up and came to the house of God and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So ends the reading. Notice the last, I don't know, three weeks or so, this is the third battle they're getting into now. The first battle, they just assumed that the Lord, they, they pretty much were telling the Lord, this is what we're going to do, and this is the outcome we expect. And it didn't go the way they thought it was going to go. Then they came and they wept a second time before the Lord. They're beginning to realize, well, maybe we're the ones that need to take more time and, and, and discern what the Lord is trying to say to us. Now, for the third time, they added fasting in it. And another important element, they've asked it, they, they added offering burnt offerings. Because, in other words, they're de beginning to discern that there is something wrong and that God's purposes are different from their own. And that's what we do, isn't it, beloved? We, we many times assume that we're... We know how the prayer is supposed to be answered. We know how the outcome is supposed to do. Because as a matter of fact, we're in the right all the time, right? Kind of, we, we think that at times. But the Lord has different reasons. He answers our prayer a different way. And He's working sanctification in us. And I notice this time, you know, the question might be, are they even saved? Yeah, they're saved. You know, the majority of them are saved. But what happens is when you're, when you're, uh, you don't know the Lord yet, and suddenly you're being convicted. Suddenly stuff is starting to make sense to you in the Bible and whatnot, and, and you, you begin to have this fear and awe that you're a sinner, and then and that you're broken God's commandments. Suddenly it means something to you now. And so then you, you, you make that confession of faith because the Holy Spirit's working in you. You receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's a, the common experience of every believer. Now you're walking along in your relationship with the Lord, and this happens. You know, we're praying to the Lord, but we're not getting the answers that we perceive we should be getting in this situation. And what's happening, it happens to all of us as Christians, is we begin to discern a strain in our relationship with the Lord. Something is just... We're discerning something isn't right. That's a, that's a blessing. Every day we wake up in the morning and we should be analyzing our motives. We should be saying, and as you go through the day, continually confessing. Yes, because we're sinning. But we need to keep our relationship with Jesus Christ fresh. There's a difference between coming to faith and then after coming to faith, beginning to feel that strain in your relationship with the Lord. And this is what's happening with them. Now, verse 27 and 28 says, 
So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, and the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother? Uh, go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. So ends the reading of the word. Notice what the difference is here? Every time they came before the Lord the first time to go after the Benjamites, met with the Benjamites were accused of. They had a group of men who came and tried to, well, rape the the priest, whatever he was, and he gave them his concubine. And they abused her all night, killed her, and he takes the concubine, chops her up in 12 pieces, and sends it to all the tribes, saying, something has to be done with these group of people that have committed this atrocious act. But what happens? is So they go up and they think they're in the right, and they're saying, the Lord, who shall go up first against Benjamin? The Lord doesn't say he's going to deliver them into the hand. He just says, send Judah first. Then the second time, we're going up again. And now this time, they notice the change here. Notice now they're going to start going through the procedures they should have been going through the first time. Now they, they come before the high priest, fin Phineas. And now they're beginning to have intercession. Now they're beginning to, to understand there's something wrong here. They ask, says they ask, should we quit? Should, what we should, should we do here? They're now open to the Lord's answer and not just assuming it. And we're going to talk about the high priest at the end of the message. Our high priest that we have now. But I just want to bring in Phineas for now. And notice too the verb. When you go back to Judges chapter 1, the very beginning. In Judges chapter 1, verse 2. There's a verb that's being used. It's in the perfect meaning that God will complete the fullness of the victory. When you go back to the very beginning of Judges, verse 2, it says, And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. He's saying, I'm going to give you fullness of victory. Remember what happened the first time? Judah sent Judah first, but he didn't say he was going to give them victory. Fullness of victory at least. And that's a picture of us when God, when we become saved, we're going to have the complete victory over sin. We are. But that's going to be the day that you pass from this world to the next. You will be completely sanctified. But now in this life, we are battling sin. But I thought that was unique because the verb now is in the imperfect, meaning God, God hasn't established to them the length that they were to carry out this mission against Benjamin, the Benjamins, Benjamites. God doesn't instruct them. In other words, he's not telling them to annihilate, completely wipe out Benjamin. He's telling them to go up and administer discipline, is basically what he's saying. And you know, that speaks to us. You know, we, you have a church, you have a disciplinary action in a church. We're for we are to forgive just as God has forgiven us. In church discipline, then, when we ever have to administer a church discipline, it's to reconcile people back to the body of Christ and not become these strict judges making unwise and hypocritical measures for them to reach, which is impossible. Church discipline is just to reconcile people back. So he's not telling them to go and wipe out the Benjamites but that's what they're going to end up trying to do. And we'll get to that probably next week. But verses 29 through 32 says, Then Israel sent men in ambush all around Gibeah. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and put themselves in battle array against Gibeah as at the other times. So the children of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city. They began to strike down and kill some of the people, as at other times, in the highways, one of which goes up to Bethel and the other to Gibeah, and in the field about 30 men of Israel. 
And the children of Benjamin said, They are defeated before us as at first. But the children of Israel said, Let us flee and draw them away from the city to, to the highways. So ends the reading. So what we have here is we have two reports of the third battle. This is the third and final battle. One is a general overview, verses 29 through 36, and the other is a more of a detailed close-up of the same battle, verses 37 through 48. And what Israel is doing here is they're setting up a large part of its army to ambush the Benjamite city. So they're sitting in an ambush. But another segment, but they have another segment of the people of Israel who actually begins the attack on Benjamin. Now this is interesting. Because on both earlier occasions, the Benjamites came out, they started dragging down Israel, and Israel fled, flees. This time, to the Benjamites, it looks like the same thing is happening again. We're defeating them again. Don't they ever get a clue? And they get this, this overconfident, prideful error about them. We're defeating them again, but in reality, they've set an ambush. And remember, it's been a couple weeks now, but when the Holy Spirit begins to work effectively in us, we become more dependent and we trust in the Lord's plan. While others remain prideful and remain, I would say, overconfident. So we just remember, here we have Israel. They're coming up to the Lord and they're saying, we need to go up against the Benjamites. Well, the Lord never told them in the first place or how much of, uh, how exactly what he wants them to do. They get beat back by the smaller army. And they're wondering, and people wondering, especially the Benjamites, who most of them probably aren't saved, they're wondering, look at these people. We're beating them. They must be out of sync with the Lord. Not like us. We're always winning. We're always defeating them. We must be in the right with the Lord. When in reality, the opposite was occurring. And this is what happens to each one of us, beloved. As we go through, the Lord is sanctifying us more into His image. Which means what? Which means He's going to work humility and dependence on us. He's going to tear down the strongholds of overconfidence and pride that the world exhibits. That we used to exhibit in ourselves before we became born again. So the world may be watching us saying, Man, this, this guy is like Ken is always going through all these hard circumstances. He's supposed to be praying to this God. Why is he experiencing peace and prosperity like we are? And in reality, what's happening is the Lord's working in Ken effectively to make him more like Jesus Christ, weaning from the world. Whereas the people outside, the Lord's not working in them. And they're becoming more overconfident, more prideful. But look at verses 33 through 36. It says, So all the men of Israel rose from their place and put themselves in battle array at Baal Tamar. Then Israel's men in ambush burst forth from their position in the plain of Gibeah. And 10,000 select men from all Israel came against Gibeah, and the battle was fierce. But the Benjamites did not know that disaster was upon them. The Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel. And the children of Israel destroyed that day 25,100 Benjamites, all of these through the sword. So the children of Benjamin saw that they were defeated. The men of Israel had given, had given ground to the Benjamites because they had relied on the men in ambush whom they had set against Gibeah. So ends the reading. So again, the Lord is finally accomplishing His purpose through Israel, who looked like to the world, these guys, what kind of God are they worshiping? They're always being defeated. Where in reality, God was working sanctification in them. But here's the, it, back in verse 34, when it says, and it, and it says, but the Benjamites did not know that disaster was upon them. Here are the Benjamites who are coming out full of pride and overconfidence, thinking we're defeating them again. 
they're going headlong into this battle when they don't realize that the ambush has been set around them and they're going to be destroyed. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Hand Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Well, he says everybody in the human race is like sitting on a, we uh, a spider web. And it can break at any time right into the, the pits of hell. And that's us, beloved. That's the whole human race. John 3.36. John 3.36. We've talked about this verse quite often. Let me grab it here. John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son should not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. So if you're not in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, that's in the present tense, that means the wrath of God is sitting upon you, ready to devour you at any moment. At any moment. They didn't realize how close they were to being destroyed. And that's non-believers in the world. They don't realize they could die in the next second. They could die next week. They could die a month from now, a year from now, ten years from now. It could happen just like that spider web melting because of the flames coming up and they perishing in the flames. So you have to be reconciled with Jesus Christ. Well, people that are not reconciled are walking around on the verge of any moment going to hell. And that's what I see in that verse. But we'll go to verse 37. It says, And the men in ambush quickly rushed upon Gibeah. The men in ambush spread out, struck the whole city with the edge of the sword. So ends the reading. So here's a, maybe a principle I get out of this verse. Back in verse 35, we have the divine view of the conflict. God, the Holy One, already knows what's going to happen in the conflict. Because he's the one that has ordained it. He already knows what's going to happen in Mallory's life, in Mary Jo's life, in Marla's life, because he's ordained it. He's ordained everything that happens. Nothing catches the Holy One off guard. Nothing. And so that's it's like a, a, a camera long shot of the whole thing. But, the, the, but that's the perspective of Yahweh. He already knows what's going to happen. But then you get down to verse 37. And that's like the focus of the ambush. Remember we're talking about the ambush surrounding Gibeah. So the people of Benjamin don't know that they're on the verge of being destroyed. They're seeing what's right in front of them, which is this ambush. Now they know we're in trouble here. But God already knows the overview of everything. We just know what happens to us from day to day. In verse 38 to 43, it says, Now the appointed signal between the men of Israel and the men in ambush was that they would make a great cloud of smoke rise up from the city, whereupon the men of Israel would turn in battle. Now Benjamin had begun to strike and kill about 30 of the men of Israel, for they said, Surely they are defeated before us as in the first battle. But when the cloud began to rise from the city in a column of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and there was a whole city going up in smoke to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned back, the men of Benjamin panicked, for they saw that disaster had come upon them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel in the direction of the wilderness. But the battle overtook them, and whoever came out of the cities they destroyed in their midst. They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them, and easily trampled them down as far as the front of Gibeah toward the east. So ends the reading. So the battle strategy had been carefully planned ahead of time by Israel. And you know, it, so we're responsible. Don't get me wrong. We're responsible for every action, every thought that we have. There is nothing wrong with them seeking the Lord's mind, planning this strategy out of how we're going to defeat Benjamin. That's what the Lord wants us to do. It's just like here at Evergreen Baptist Fellowship. we got several things we need to do. We need to have a strategy of how we're going to do this. We need to seek the Lord's mind. We need to have a strategy on things that we're going to do, having the gospel proceed out. 
That's all it's saying here. They're finally listening to the Lord, and they come up with this strategy, and the Lord has blessed that strategy. Now, verses 44 through 48 says, And 18,000 men of Benjamin fell. All these were men of valor. Then they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Rimon, and they cut down 5,000 of them on the highways. Then they pursued them relentlessly up to Gibeah and killed 2,000 of them. So all who fell of Benjamin that day were 25,000 men who drew the sword. All those were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Ramon. And they stayed at the rock of Ramon for four months. And the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin and struck them down with the edge of the sword. From every city, men and beasts, all who were found. They also set fire to all the cities that they came to. So when the reading. So this paragraph is horrific. There's no doubt about it. As the survivors of the battle, they're hunted down and they're butchered. Literally butchered. And you know what that says, beloved? Sin, when it's left unchecked, leaves a person ripe for eternal judgment. So we should always be thankful the Lord's working in our heart, convicting us every day, weaning us from the world. You know what the hardening of the heart, I've talked about this before, when it talks about Pharaoh's heart being hardened. What that's saying is the Holy Spirit restrains us. Okay, it says that in Thessalonians. The Holy Spirit restrains evil, not only in this world, but in each one of us. And when he starts removing that restraining influence on us like he did with Pharaoh, he's not forcing Pharaoh to do anything he doesn't want to do. He's releasing that restraining power and allowing Pharaoh to do what he really wants to do, to be who he really, really wants to be. So just like the world today, the Lord has an influence. If he didn't have the Holy Spirit wasn't curbing sin, we wouldn't be able to walk outside this church building. So the Lord is good. Imagine what the tribulation is going to be like when the Holy Spirit continuously removes that restraining influence. So the Lord allows Israel to lose two battles. This is the third battle. God's will is done now. And it's done through the tribes of Israel, even though their intent was far different than God's intent. Their intent, they didn't think they were going to be humiliated and lose to an inferior army twice. But that was the Lord's will for them. And the world didn't understand that. But that, so, you know, as we go through life, He's weaning his bride from the world. Sin is messy. Sin is absolutely messy. Life is messy. The cross was messy. Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, actually took my brother's sin and it was placed on Christ. He took Jim's sin and place it on Christ. A sinless, sinless being that never had a, a sinless God that never had a, sin, a sinful thought or action in his mind. And he bore the wrath of God for his bride. So if you think your life gets messy, it does. And it will get messy until the day he takes you home. Just remember the cross. How messy it got for God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And you know, we look at this, and I, and I see we'll, we'll expand on this more next week, but here we have the bench that Israel is offended at these loose cannons that did such a horrific act amongst Israel, but they don't see themselves. Look what they're doing. They're butchering people, left unchecked. But you know what? They're going to begin to realize you know, maybe we're not so self-righteous that we thought we were. And how often do we get angry over sin and judge it without ever looking at the sin in our own hearts? 
See, we're all sinners. Some of us are saved by grace alone. And those of us that are saved, it's really easy for us to get blinded to that fact. We start comparing ourselves with other people and saying, look how sinful that person is. But what the Lord is doing, He's uncovering us, our sin, to ourselves. And you know what? We can't exercise judgment in the name of the Lord with self-righteous hearts. That's what Israel was beginning to do. we got to go get these rebel rousers that have committed this atrocity. They aren't looking at their own heart. And that's what the Lord was doing, those two defeats. He was revealing to them what's in their heart. See, what Christ desires is humble and dependent people. That's the badge of being a Christian. Humility and dependence. So he's going to work in our lives to bring us to humility and dependence on him alone. The world will never understand that. They think it's all about pride and overconfidence, self-confidence. But in reality, it's the opposite. And it's only then, just like here, it's only then when he works that humility and independence that we're ready for service. That we're ready to be used by him. But there's another thing that Israel is beginning to realize. Maybe they aren't so different from their rebel rousers after they almost annihilated this. See, that now they're ready for service in the name of the Lord. Their hearts have been humbled. And they recognize, this is the first thing they recognize, that they were agents, they were instruments of God's judgment because of this grievous sin in Benjamin. But they also began to realize they were no better than them. But in spite of Israel's setbacks and problems, they have divine guidance through Phineas, the high priest, one way. So the question I'm asking today, who's up? we don't have a high priest anymore. Our high priest is Jesus Christ. That's who we go to. Our high priest is Jesus Christ. That we have access to the throne of grace. We have access to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus every day. So let's examine some of the claims that when people say, well, you can pray to people in heaven, have them pray for us. Okay? Asking other believers on earth to pray for us is certainly biblical. I mean, I can quote several verses. I'll just quote one for now. 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 3. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 3. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. He's talking about praying for other believers on this earth. There's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, we're commanded to. It's a blessing when we pray for other believers. But the Bible nowhere mentions anyone asking someone in heaven to pray for him or her, except Jesus Christ, our high priest. The Bible nowhere describes anyone in heaven praying for anyone on earth. Nowhere do you find that in Scripture. The Bible gives absolutely no indication that the saints in heaven can hear our prayers. They're not omniscient. Only God's omniscient. Now think about what I'm saying here. Even when you're glorified in heaven, there, we're still finite beings, okay, with limitations. We don't become God. So how could somebody in heaven possibly hear prayers of millions of people at one time? You can't. It's impossible. Whenever the Bible starts talking about praying or speaking with the dead, it's always in a negative connotation. For instance, again, there's a lot of verses, but I'll just go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 through 13. Now, when I read these verses, think about our world today. There should not be found among you anyone who makes a son or daughter pass through the fire. That's Moloch, sacrificing newly born babies. Or anyone who practices witchcraft. That's an end thing now, isn't it? Oh, it's only white witchcraft. White magic, I think is what they call it. 
or a soothsayer, or one who interprets, interprets omens or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium. We had a show on TV about going through a medium. Or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. Now let me make a statement here. Somebody might say, well yeah, but when I'm praying to somebody in heaven, they're more alive than I am right now. Okay, true. So are the people in hell. People in hell are more alive than we are right now because their conscience is activated 100%. So when we talk about dead, well, it's, I'll, I'll say it's like, it's like a metaphor maybe. It's a figure of speech of leaving this world. Because once you're born in this world, you never die. You never die. You will either live for eternity in heaven or live for eternity in hell. But you never cease to exist. So that's not a good argument that they're more alive than we are in heaven. And nobody, let's get serious here, nobody can take Christ's place. There's only one mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ. No one else can mediate for us. And since Jesus is the only mediator, nobody else has that role in heaven. You know what? But I'll just finish with this. Further, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ himself is interceding for us before the Father. Colin's favorite book. Hebrews 7, verse 24 and 25 says, But he, Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. That's important. Unchangeable priesthood. The reason they had to keep changing priests out, and even the high priest, because they, they kept dying. But now Jesus comes, and he has the endless life. He's our high priest. Since he's eternal, we don't need any other high priest. And then verse 25, Therefore he's also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. It's Christ that are continuously making intercession for us. We don't need anybody else to make an intercession for us. It's Jesus Christ and Him alone. 